It is my intention to give a full account of the first war between Rome and Carthage, which was fought for the possession of Sicily. This is because it would be hard to think of a conflict which went on for longer, demanded more effort from both sides, or was prosecuted with a more brutal vigour, nor one which featured more battles or more sudden changes of fortune. The two cities which fought it were still at this time possessed of customs and institutions that were yet to fall into decadence. Both were dependent chiefly on their own efforts rather than on good luck for their successes, and both were equally matched in terms of their resources, which is why we can arrive at a more accurate assessment of the respective qualities and attributes of the two combatants in this particular war than we can by studying any comparable conflict. So that was the Greek writer Polybius talking about one of the titanic clashes, not just in ancient history, but Tom, in all history, it is the first Punic War between Rome and Carthage. It is. I guess the Carthaginians would have called it the first Roman War. So that's a perspective that perhaps we could try and keep in mind. But yes, it is. I mean, it is the great superpower clash in antiquity. And the two sides are perfectly matched because um, Carthage is the whale. Rome is the elephant. Carthage's wealth is in trade. Rome's in her resources of manpower. Carthage has been a great power for centuries. Rome is essentially an upstart. Um, so that I think is what Polybius is is talking about when he says that you know, this is so interesting. You can you can you can gauge the respective strengths of the two cities. And so we're in the third century BC. Just for those people who haven't listened to previous episodes, Carthage is on the shores of North Africa, present day Tunis. Maritime power, mercantile power, as you said. Rome has taken all Italy by now, has absorbed Latium, all these other people, Campania and so on, um, and has incorporated them into 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 Romanness, hasn't it? Into its manpower, into its uh, lots of them. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, we we talked in the previous episode about how up until this point, um, the fact that Rome and Carthage are so different has actually made them seem complementary rather than antagonistic because they they have their own kind of dimensions their own spheres in which they operate so again we we looked at how there have been various peace treaties they were allies against this um king from this greek king uh, called pyrrhus who had come over and defeated the romans but these had been pyrrhic victories and so effectively the romans had won the war um and we also mentioned how pyrrhus before he left to go back um, back to Epirus, his kingdom, um, on, the, on the other side of the Adriatic, had looked at Sicily in particular, where Carthage for many, many centuries had established a kind of big, a sphere of influence in the western half of the island. And he'd said, Sicily will make a beautiful killing field for the Romans and the Carthaginians. So he's kind of, he's seeing that this is going to be the flashpoint and I mean, he's not wrong <laughs> because the Romans are in Regium on the very toe of Italy. Uh, and of course, on the other side of the Straits, you have um, Messina, what the, back in classical times was Messana. Um, and it's been argued that, you know, the Romans are nervous. They're nervous that the Carthaginians might, um, you know, they've got this great fleet that their control of the Italian coastline um, might leave them very exposed. But there's a very great scholar of, of Roman imperialism called William Harris, who makes a brilliantly convincing case that war was inevitable above all because Rome is a state that is a, kind of attuned to violence. You know, it's a, we talked again in the previous episode, there's this kind of mafiosi quality to them, never to accept disrespect. So, so just on that, obviously there comes a point in Roman history where they become more conservative. What we have, we hold kind of, I don't know, Trajan or something. But at this point, would you say expansionism, imperialism, for want of a better word, is absolutely built into their system, partly because it's the, the credo of the Republic, but also because of the the, the structural competition between different sort yeah. of generals and so on? Yes. So you win political promotion and you, you win the, the Onestas, the kind of the glorious reputation in the face of your fellow citizens by winning but, but by achieving great things for your city. And so mm. that is kind of baked into the structure of Roman society. 
Um, I mean, it has to be said that the Romans do not see themselves as predatory. They see themselves as a terribly moral people who essentially are going to war in self-defense. So there's yeah. this kind of weird thing that the Romans end up conquering the world effectively in self-defense. Right. Um, so they, And they would say that the proof of the fact that they are a moral people is that the gods have favored them and brought them victory. So they don't see themselves as ruthless imperialists, although mm. effectively that is what they are. But they are definitely a kind of, um, you know, a mut new mutant element in this centuries old conflict in Sicily between the Greeks and the Carthaginians. And on top of that, of course, the Greeks and the Carthaginians are known factors to each other. But I think Carthage also, you know, has has reason to be hostile to Rome, actually. Because, of course, the, the, the Greeks are kind of known territory to the Carthaginians. They've been fighting them for so long. But Rome is a kind of alarming and novel element of this. And so much later, there's a historian, Cassius Dio, writing about, about the build-up to the First Punic War. And he, he says the Carthaginians, who had been a great power for so long, and the Romans, who were growing ever stronger by the year, could not help but cast envious eyes on each other. So that's what um, American geopolitical strategists today would call the Thucydides trap. Right, it's the US but, and China or whatever. Yeah, yes, or, or, or um, Britain and, and Germany under the Kaiser. Yes. The anxiety of the established power and you know nervousness about a rising power. And so it's not surprising that it all kicks off in Messina. So the, the point that is nearest in Sicily to Italy. And there's a bunch of uh, Italian mercenaries from Campania who are called the Mamatines after this brilliantly named god Mamas, who <laughs> right. is an, Ita an Italian war god. And they've been working for Agathocles, the tyrant of Syracuse, who had gone off and invaded um, Africa and then been defeated. And so they've been made redundant. And so they come to Messina and they seize control of it. Uh, and Hero, who is the the king of Syracuse, he's he's a guy who's, you know, as in the tradition of um, Syracuse and tyrants, he comes from nowhere. He makes himself a tyrant and then king of Syracuse. And he's doing what kings of Syracuse always do, which is to eye up opportunities in cities in Sicily that are, are going through domestic trouble. And so he looks and sees that uh, these Mamatines are in, in uh, have seized the city, that the Messenians don't really want them there. And so he advances against Messina to try and kick them out and take control of the city for himself. So what the Mamatines do, they appeal to Carthage for help, which is again, yeah. traditional. This is what you always do in Sicily, but just to hedge their bets, they also appeal to Rome. Carthaginians don't know this. So the Carthaginians, they, they move into Messina, they take control of it, and they think, brilliant, you know, this is par for the course. But then a Roman agent turns up, actually a Claudius. So one of the, you know, this, this very distinguished political dynasty in Rome, the Claudians. And he wins the Mamertines over and gets them to expel the Carthaginians. Um, so the, the Romans... Most unexpectedly, to the surprise of both the Greeks and the Carthaginians, are now they've now seized control of Messina, and this you can imagine sends shock waves through mm. the entire entire island. And the Romans do what the Romans always do in the situation, which is to double down. So um, another Claudius, who's the consul Appius Claudius. Even though they don't have any ships, they commandeer kind of fishing boats and all this kind of thing. They arrive in Messina. And they defeat a Syracusan army and they defeat a Carthaginian army. And in 263, 40,000 men and both consuls arrive in Messina. And this is enough to get all the cities in, uh, all the Greek cities in Sicily to sign up to the Romans. Hero, the Syracusan king, he sues for terms. Um, the Romans agree that he can stay as king in Syracuse, effectively be independent. But from this point on, he has to serve as an ally of the Roman people. And... You know, within a couple of years, the Romans have basically established them a, a, a supremacy over the Greek eastern half of Sicily. And this is a, a nightmare for Carthage because they don't want the Romans in Sicily. They know what they're dealing with, with the Greeks, mm. but not with the Romans. And do the Romans and, know how provocative? They must be c conscious that this is unbelievably provocative to the Carthaginians who have been fighting the Greeks for control of Sicily for so long. So 
is there a sense so has has that first claudius done this on his own initiative and basically the romans are being dragged in it's a bit like the way that you know people say the british empire was kind of parts of it were acquired in a kind of fit of absence of mind because no. I, so I think it's is, is it being centrally directed has it been, have people sat around a kind of map in rome and said this is the time has that well, happened it's interesting. There is some embarrassment around the Roman support for the Mamertines because the Mamertines have seized the city illegally. And so the Romans are a little bit nervous that maybe the Mamertines actually have offended the gods. They've offended the laws of hospitality. But they brush that aside. They they convince themselves that they're entirely morally justified, <laughs> that, that this is what the gods want. And so they pile in. And hmm. the fact that the Carthaginians are offended and demand the Roman withdrawal is seen as disrespect. And so the Romans are fully up for, you know, full full scale war. And the Carthaginians, because they are not prepared to tolerate the intrusion of this upstart power into their sphere of influence, likewise are completely committed to it. And the Carthaginians, although they respect uh, Roman land forces, the Carthaginians are dependent on mercenaries. They don't have this kind of great body of citizens that the Romans can command. They're confident of victory because of course, Sicily is an island. They are the great maritime power. And the Romans don't have a fleet, so right. Carthage thinks we we you know we 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 can ace this. And so what they do, they they have various kind of uh, so there's a place Lilibaeum, which is on the the kind of the furthest most western point, uh, Panormus, which will um, is is Palermo, modern day Palermo. Palermo is a, an old Phoenician city. Lilibaeum was deliberately founded to be a, a, an impregnable fortress of Carthaginian power. But what they actually decide to do is to seize control of a Greek city, Akragas, at modern day Agrigento, mm -hmm. um, because it's further to the uh, to the east on the southern coast. So it's towards where the Romans are operating, but it can be easily supplied from Carthage. So they um, it's it's a Greek city. Um, it's famous for having been once ruled by a, a notorious tyrant who used to boil people to death inside a great bronze bull. And it's large and prosperous. There are kind of maybe 25, 30,000 people there. Um, and they they fortify it. The Romans pile in, they besiege it. Carthage sends a huge relief force, 60 elephants, all the works. And Dominic, I'm sure you can guess the name of the guy in charge of it. Uh, he's yet another Hanno, is he? He is a Hanno. He's yet another Hanno. Yes. But this is a terrible, he's a terrible general. So he lands with his forces and he looks down from a hill at the Romans and he thinks, oh, I don't really want to fight them. A bit nervous of it. So he just stays there for two months. And then finally... You know, he's because we should say we mentioned this a couple of episodes ago, but the penalty for failure in Carthage is very, very severe. So mm. at the worst, you can be crucified, but yeah. you know, it's not good. So finally, he thinks, well, I better crack on. So he he advances against the Romans, but it's a disaster. Um, the Romans stand firm. The elephants stampede. They trample their own men. It's a complete catastrophe. And the, the commander of the Carthaginian garrison um, in Akragas realizes that all is lost. And so he and his garrison slip out. They fill the Roman trenches with straw, manage to, to get across Scarpa. The Romans move into Acragas, uh, sack it, sell all its inhabitants into slavery. And meanwhile, back in um, Carthage, Hanno loses all his civil rights and has a massive fine slapped on him. Right. And it back in been, Rome... It could have been worse. Could, could have crucified. absolutely... Yeah. yeah, it absolutely could have been worse. And back in Rome... This new, the news that they have, you know, they've brushed off the Carthaginians so easily kind of determines them in their conviction that they should kick the Carthaginians out of Sicily altogether. And the Carthaginians, they rely very heavily on mercenaries, don't they? So yeah. even at this stage, they rely on mercenaries in a way the yeah. Romans aren't? Yeah. 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 They're, basically, their troops are all mercenaries. But obviously, the problem for the Romans is that if they're going to conquer Sicily, let alone hold it, they do need a fleet. Um and this, you know, this is a real challenge because Carthage is the greatest naval power of its day. Um, it's got centuries of maritime experience. It's the the inventor, Dominic, of um, the quadrireme, mm. which is a ship that is is bigger and more powerful than the trireme. Right. Which, so it has kind of four banks of oars. Um, and it also has lots of quinqueremes, which is 
battleships with five bounds of oars, which had been right. invented by the Syracusans. They're basically so they're basically the kind of the dreadnoughts yeah. of, uh, of 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 the ancient world, and the Romans don't have any of these. So, but you know. This is exactly the kind of challenge the Romans relish. So um, a, a quincareem has been shipwrecked on the, the Italian coast, the Carthaginian quincareem. So they take it and they disassemble it because the way the Carthaginians build ships, and we know this because um, the shipwreck of one of them has been found, they kind of built them in the way that you might build a cabinet from Ikea. They're kind of flat packs. They're kind right. of numbered pieces and you can stick them all together. And so this actually makes it quite easy for the Romans to work out how to oh, build. Just to copy it, yeah. Yeah, just to copy it. And so they do this and they build 100 quinqueremes, 20 triremes. And Polybius, you know, our, our Greek historian, who's our main source for this, terribly impressed. And he says of this that nothing better illustrates the remarkable spirit and boldness of the Romans. And so they build this great fleet. None of the Romans have any naval experience at all but they kind of go sailing down to try and confront the Carthaginians and it's an absolute disaster they kind of they they sail into an enemy harbor um the Carthaginians come out all the crews panic jump into the into the sea and the whole force is taken prisoner but does this put the Romans off probably not no it doesn't because the Romans realize that they're never going to be able to match the, the Carthaginians in terms of their mobility, you know, the, the art of ramming a ship, of all that kind of stuff. But what the Romans are really good at is, of course, fighting on land. And so the Roman wheeze is to turn naval battles into land battles. And they do this by inventing a thing they call the corvus, which is a crow. So it's, um, it's a, a, a kind of boarding bridge that has a huge, great spike on the end. So like the beak of a you know, a crow or a raven. And you sail up beside uh, the enemy ship and you release this and the spike sinks into the boards of the enemy ship. And then all your, you know, your soldiers, your Marines can pile across, slaughter the enemy and yeah. seize control of the, uh, of the enemy ship. It's a brilliant invention. No one thought of it before. And so the Romans, very excited, they sail out. Um, and in 260, they creep up on the Carthaginian fleet who have no idea what's about to hit them um, at a place called Milai off uh, northern Sicily. And it's a tremendous success. They they win. And again, Polybius says it's that the battle became exactly like a battle on land. Right. So they've turned it into the kind of battle that they know and are very proficient at. Yes, absolutely. Um, and for the Carthaginians, you can imagine this is a tremendous shock to be beaten by a bunch of, of landlubbers. <laughs> and so the, the remnants of the Carthaginian fleet sail off to Sardinia and they're so pissed off with the Carthaginian admiral. They don't find him, Dominic. They don't deprive him no, of his civic rights. Him. They crucify him. And Tom, as you've noted there, um, this is a battle referred to in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Yes, so in very the first, sinister the first passage. part of it, isn't it? There, the narrator recognises... Stetson, you who, are with me, you who are with me in the ships at Milai, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Um, I wonder why, well, I don't know why T.S. Eliot chose that particular battle. Do you know, Tom? I, I think because the the scale of slaughter and fighting in the uh, in this war mm. uh, must have reminded Eliot of the scale of slaughter in the First in the Great World War. War. Yeah. Yeah, the kind of the, the horror of it. Um, and... It just goes on and on and on because even though, you know, Milai is a, is a great victory, but it doesn't, it doesn't bring the Carthaginians to defeat at all. Because weirdly, despite the fact the Romans have now won at sea, they're actually doing quite badly in the land war in Sicily because the Carthaginians also, just as the Romans have learned how to fight on the sea, the Carthaginians have learned how to fight the Romans on land. And they do it by avoiding pitch battle, by adopting um, kind of guerrilla tactics Mm. And the Romans, a bit like the Americans in Vietnam, uh, you know, or kind of colonial power, European colonial powers, get so cross with this that they start conducting reprisals against local populations. They lose hearts and minds, oh, and right. yeah. their control over Greek Sicily starts to kind of to wobble. Yeah, and so in in two five six, so that's four years after Milai, they decide to do what the Romans have always been good at, which is going for the jugular. And they decide to follow the example that had been set by Agathocles, the Syracusan tyrant who had invaded Africa, 
and launch a full-blown invasion of Carthage itself. And so they they have they've got by now 330 ships and they yeah. load these ships with 140,000 men. Both the consuls are in charge of this great armada, sails across the Mediterranean towards Africa. And the Carthaginians sail out to oppose them with a fleet that has 150,000 men. Tom, are these and, numbers, can we rely on these numbers or are these made up according to the Roman sort of uh, literary I think, practice of I, inflation? I think we probably can. And even if they're not precise, they reflect a fact that is noted by Greeks at the time and, and gets kind of uh, reported by Polybius, uh, our, our favourite Greek source. It, it's seen as being a battle beyond the dreams of people in the eastern half of the Mediterranean. So that the, the the Greek world is accustomed to think of itself as you know these are the these are the great powers, and now suddenly they're they're getting reports of this battle, which is on a scale larger than anything they could comprehend. And it always reminds me of the Battle of the Midway uh, in the the Second World War between the Americans and the Japanese fleets. Yeah, um, and how Europeans must have you know felt this is a different order of conflict completely. Um, so I think it's. It's generally held to have been the, the the single largest naval battle in antiquity, and it's a victory for the Romans. They win, so they land in Africa. They 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 capture a, a um, various towns. They establish a bridgehead, and having done that, one of the two consuls is ordered home because the Romans they obviously don't want to stake everything on this throw. Hmm. They want to keep reserves, but um, uh, one of the two consuls, a guy called Regulus, is ordered to stay there. He has 40 ships, 15,000 infantry, 500 cavalry. The figures come from Polybius. And he goes out, he, he, he defeats uh, a Carthaginian army that has come out to meet him. He captures more cities and then he institutes a blockade of Carthage. And the Carthaginians say, OK, well, this isn't looking good. Let's have peace negotiations. But Regulus, um, the terms he demands are too harsh. So the key sticking point is that he demands that Carthage surrender Sardinia and Sicily. And I think it's particularly Sicily. The, mm. the Carthaginians are not prepared to give up their half of Sicily, which by now has come to seem as much Carthaginian territory as, you know, the, the lands around yeah. Carthage itself. And that would mean their relegation from the yeah. Champions League places, as it were, wouldn't it? I mean, if they lost such uh, an important and rich territory... That was so important to that. That was yes. this, well, psychologically so important to them. Yes, I think so. But I think it's the I think it's the fact that they see it as being theirs. You know, it would be like I don't know, like Britain being required to surrender Yorkshire or something. Right. I mean, they they see it as being part of their territory. Yeah, and so they that means that they, like the Romans, are determined to fight on. Um, and as it happens, they have a guy on hand who is perfectly qualified to defeat the Romans because this is a Spartan called Xanthippus. So mm -hmm. we talked about how the, the, the Carthaginians employ mercenaries. He is uh, he's a mercenary. And because he's a Spartan, he's tremendously good at drill. Right. And he works out the, the best drills to defeat the Romans. And all the people in the Carthaginian army decide that actually he is the best qualified to lead them. And so rather than um, be led by a Carthaginian general, they demand to be led by Xanthippus. And Xanthippus's drills turn out to be tremendous. He's very good at tactics. Uh, he goes out to meet Regulus. The Romans are, are, are annihilated. And he's um, using elephants, right? He's Xanthippus. using elephants. The elephants crash into the Roman in infantry. The cavalry on the wings seize off the Roman cavalry. And the whole Roman army gets enveloped and, and wiped out. And Regulus himself is taken prisoner. Now... In due course, a story comes to be told about Regulus that yeah. the Carthaginians send him back to Rome to um, persuade the Romans to surrender. And Regulus goes back to Rome and he tells the Senate, on no account surrender. I Keep remember, fighting. I, Tom, I, I translated this when I was at school. I mm -hmm. remember this very story very well. It's a very noble, inspiring story. Yeah. And, then, and then Regulus, rather than staying in Rome, because he feels duty bound, goes back. Yeah. To Carthage. Amazing. And when he gets back to Carthage, there are various accounts that kind of escalate over the, the centuries the story is told. So um, Cicero says that he's put in a box with spikes in it so that he can't, um, you know, he can't kind of lean against it. Um, Augustine says that he's put in a barrel with spikes driven in it and kind of rolled down the hill. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so a, a tremendous story. It's not true. Oh, Tom, for oh, it's come not on. true. I said last time that I thought you were better than this, and yet I'm again, sorry. you've let your podcast down. What? what how I mean, do you know it's not true? Don't tell me Regulus not... died happily in his bed at the age of. We don't know 82. what happened to him. He probably just dies in in, in Carthage. In it, it comes to be. It comes to be told because it, it serves to illustrate, you know, the, the, this idea that Punic faith is is treachery. Roman right. faith is is honesty. He's given his word, and it's a kind of stirring patriotic tale. And in fact, Augustine loves it because it, it reminds him of um, of Christian martyrs. And so he says that Regulus was the, the noblest Roman of them all, even though right. you know it, it, it didn't actually happen. Anyway, but but the salient fact is is that the Roman are defeated in Africa, and then the year after this, they they lose two float fleets in a row to violent storms so 300 ships are lost 100,000 men are drowned and so this is the point again where if this was a normal war the kind of war that the Greeks and the Carthaginians had been fighting the Romans would have negotiated you know peace treaties would have been opened up yeah there would have been spheres of influence in Sicily decided but the Romans don't do this they just keep coming back and they keep suffering terrible losses at sea because they win the battles but because they're not you know they're not skilled mariners they can't read the waves they can't read the weather they keep getting storms and the most notorious example of this which is mentioned in i claudius it's the first time i came across it is that in 249 bc um a roman fleet under another claudius publius claudius pulcher um are sent to launch an attack on a, a a, a port held by the Carthaginians called Drapana in, mm -hmm. uh, in Sicily. And Claudius, is, his fleet is stationed off Drapana. He wants to attack. The Romans have to consult the sacred chickens to find out whether the, uh, you know, wh wh whether the gods are in favour. And the report comes back that the chickens are refusing to eat their food, to which Claudius says, they must be thirsty. He goes, he picks them up and he throws them in the sea. He then sails in, <laughs> gets absolutely annihilated, and only 30 Roman ships survive. Um, so it, it's an absolute disaster. Claudius goes back to Rome, gets prosecuted, um, heavily fined. And there's another notorious story that his sister, Claudia, is um, she's trying to get through a, a crowd in the forum, and, and she can't because it's so thick. And she's said to have cried out, I wish my brother would lose another battle. So in other oh, words, right, to get rid of you know, the population people. of yeah. Rome would be thinned out. And so the, the, these are kind of cited as examples of Claudian arrogance, um, that Claudians <laughs> are either very noble, like Appius Claudius, the guy who had persuaded the Romans yeah. to fight on against Pyrrhus, or they, they're the kind of people who chuck sacred chickens into the sea or kind of wish defeat on the Romans. But in Sicily itself, the Romans are, are starting to really grind the Carthaginians down. So in 254, they capture Panormus, uh, um, Palermo, Palermo <clears throat> which Polybius describes as being the strongest Carthaginian city in Sicily. Other Carthaginians follow, um, and every attempt to oppose the Romans in battle ends in disaster for the Carthaginians. And, you know, every year it seems captured elephants are being paraded through the streets of Rome. Until by 250, only two strongholds are left. So Drapana, which is the, the port that had been saved by the chicken-related incident with <laughs> Claudius, and the, the, the great, great naval base of Lilybaeum. You know, this, this naval fortress with its massive walls and its moat. Um, and this has been under siege. This, the Carthaginians invest it in 250, but it holds out. And it's really starting to look bad for Carthage now. So they've lost almost all their territory except for these two cities. The sea lanes can no longer be relied upon because the Romans have the, have these fleets. And as a result of that, they are losing money. And if they're losing money, they're losing manpower because they need money to pay for their mercenaries. So it's looking terrible. It's a death spiral, so, Tom. It is a death spiral. And they, you know, they need a hero. Where are they going to find a hero, Dominic? Well, I think they'll probably find one after the break. Won't they? They Otherwise, will. It'll be a very short podcast. But I they think the, the exciting thing for our listeners is they are going to find a hero, and this is going to be one of the most thrilling comebacks in the in the history of humankind. 
So on that bombshell, please join us after the break to find out who that hero is. The trireme advanced in fierce and haughty fashion, cleaving the foam around it, the latine yard quite square, and the sail bulging down the whole length of the mast. Its gigantic oars kept time as they beat the water. Every now and then the extremity of the keel, which was shaped like a ploughshare, would appear, and the ivory-headed horse, rearing both its feet beneath a spur which terminated the prow, would seem to be speeding over the plains of the sea. As it rounded the promontory, the wind ceased, the sail fell, and a man was seen standing bareheaded beside the pilot. It was he, Hamilcar the Suffet. About his sides he wore gleaming sheets of steel. A red cloak fastened to his shoulders left his arms visible. Two pearls of great length hung from his ears, and his black, bushy beard rested on his throat. So that is the appearance Gustave Flaubert's novel Sanombo of the hero of Carthage, Hamilcar the Suffet, Hamilcar Barker, one of the great names, Tom, of antiquity. And he is the man who is going to save the Carthaginians' bacon in this terrible mess they've got themselves in to against the Romans. Or, or is, is he? he? Or is he? <laughs> So you you said before the break that this is one of the great comebacks. I, I yeah. think, to be honest, it's more of a holding operation. So, okay. so but you know, but that, that is not to be underestimated. No. So, so Hamilcar, Hamilcar is he's appointed commander in chief of Carthaginian forces in Sicily in two four seven. There aren't many Carthaginian forces in Sicily by this point, but you know, he they are his to command. He is from a very distinguished family. Carthage is a kind of aristocratic republic, and so you you tend not to be appointed unless you are distinguished. And actually, um, he he claims to be descended from a, a brother of Elissa or Dido, the woman who um, the legendary founder of Carthage. He's relatively young, um, and he is famously energetic. He's famously proactive, and so much so that he gets the nickname of Barker, which seems to have meant kind of lightning. Mm. Um, so he's Hamilcar, the lightning bolt. Um, he, as he sails from Carthage, he is leaving behind um, a daughter and a wife who is pregnant with another child and who in due course will turn out to be a son. And this will be the first of three boys. So bear that in mind. Hamilcar, Hamilcar's eldest son is being born while he is away in Sicily, where it has to be said the situation is completely grim because there, is, there isn't any money. And without money, they they can't you know they can't afford to pay the mercenaries. So there are about ten thousand infantry, few cavalry, and these two strongholds, Drapena and Lilabaeum, both of whom are under siege. So what uh, what um, Hamilcar decides to do? He 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 thinks there's no point in launching myself at the Romans. What I will do is I will establish myself as a kind of guerrilla commander in the heights outside Panormus which he does, and he finds this spot, Heicte, it's called, uh, which I, I I've never actually been to Palermo, so I'm not familiar with the uh, with the geography, but apparently the consensus is that it was a pla in the mountains five miles west of, of what's now Palermo, and it's it was easily defended. It had fresh water, it had uh, pasturage for the for the horses, um, yeah. and most importantly, it had access to the sea. So from here, he's able to launch his lightning raids. But the downside, of course, is that he can't actually do anything to relieve Lilibaeum or, or Drapana. He doesn't have the, the, the resources. Um, and so that's why I mean that it's not really a comeback. It's basically he is able to preserve a stalemate. And considering how, few, you know, how little money he has, how few troops he has, I mean, that's not bad. But, you know, it's, it's not a strategy that is going to enable Carthage to win the war. And of course... As the years go by, and, and Hamilcar is there for six years, his the, the numbers that he has start to fray. So in two four four, he abandons his position outside Panormus and he goes to another place, uh, a, a small town called Eryx, which had been captured by the Romans. Hamilcar takes it back, and this is just outside Drapana, and he stays camped there for two more years, harrying the Roman siege. But again, the same problem: not enough men to, you know, to to, to lift it completely. So by 242, the great crisis of the war is approaching. 
because the Romans are locked in this stalemate and they recognize that the only way ultimately they can force a victory is decisively to defeat the Carthaginians at sea. Right. So even though they've lost fleet after fleet after fleet to the weather, they decide that they will build one more, one more armada. And by this point, Rome too is very skint. And so they kind of, they, they, they take patriotic loans from the richest men in the Republic. Right. War bonds. War bonds, that kind of thing. And they're able to, you know, by the skin of their teeth to build a fleet of 200 ships. And that summer of 242, it sails for Sicily under command of one of the two consuls, um, Quintus Lutatius Catulus, and it takes the Carthaginians completely by surprise. Um, the Carthaginians, I, I mean, some people have said they were lethargic. Others have said that they were exhausted, but they mm. just haven't prepared for this crisis, which they must have known was coming. Um, the, the, the Carthaginian fleet has been kept at Carthage. The news is brought that the Romans are coming. They sail out. The Romans are nightly. Oh, disappointing. So it's just a total walkover. Total walkover because um, basically the, the the traditional situation where it's the Carthaginians who are more proficient has been turned on its head. The Romans have been practicing and practicing and practicing. And it seems that the Carthaginians haven't. Whether, right. you know, as I say, they're too, too run depressed. Out money, exhausted, run out of money. Exhausted. Run out of money. Yeah, they're just down. Um, and so they, they lose... Uh, the commanding general, who inevitably is called Hanno, <laughs> he goes back, he gets crucified, and effectively the war is now over. And Hamilcar, you know, in his mountain hideout, mm. you know, he he know he knows that this is, that it's doomed. You know, he can see the the kind of the shattered spars of the Carthaginian fleet floating off Drapana. It's all terrible. And so the Carthaginian Senate, back in the mother city says to Hamilcar, you should go and negotiate with the Romans. Um, Hamilcar does not want the shame of this to attach to himself. And so he sends the commander of Lilibaeum, a man called Gisco, to go and meet with Catulus. And Lutatius' terms, I mean, they're severe, but they're not utterly crippling. So Carthaginians have to withdraw from Sicily, but not Sardinia. So that's so that's an advance on what they so previously that's offered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have to return all their prisoners without ransom. They have to guarantee not to make war on Hero, the, the king of, of oh, Syracuse. He's still around. He's still around. Yeah. Uh, and they have to pay a kind of massive uh, Versailles-type indemnity. Right. Catulus uh, agrees to this. He goes back. He presents the terms to uh, the popular assemblies in Rome, where the mass of the Roman people say they're not, they're not tough enough. Um, so they demand a higher indemnity which the Carthaginians have no choice but to agree to. But Hamilcar is able to get the um, the Romans to agree that neither side will um, interfere in the internal business of the other power. Right. So in other words, just as the Carthaginians agree not to um, go to war with Hero in Syracuse, so the Romans are agreeing not to go to war, not to, to come to the support of any of Carthaginian subject peoples. And this is a kind of, you know, very very important if the Carthaginians to hold their empire together. And so the, the treaty is ratified by both sides. Hamilcar leads his men down from the mountain, uh, down to Trapano, board ships, sail off to uh, to Carthage. Um, and he leaves Gisco behind to supervise the withdrawal of all the other mercenaries, not just from Trapano, but from um, Lilibaeum. And meanwhile, Hamilcar has gone back to Carthage. Yeah. And the reason that he's been so desperate to head back and not to take charge of the withdrawal of the mercenaries from Sicily is because he knows, he understands the massive problem that Carthage is now facing. That the troops in Sicily are mercenaries and will want to be paid, but the treasury is empty. And because of the terms that Hamilcar has just agreed with the Romans, you know, they have to pay this indemnity. There isn't any money to pay the mercenaries. So this is why he's been so keen that Gisco gets all the responsibility right. for handling it. Hamilcar is a very shrewd politician, um, very brilliant self-publicist. So he's able to present himself as the guy who carried the fight on to the very end, then did his patriotic duty by getting the best terms that he could. But he doesn't want to be associated with what this surrender actually means. And the truth is that the situation with the mercenaries is very, very 
alarming because the mercenaries arrive in Africa and the Carthaginians have failed to take hostages for their good behavior before they land in Africa. And this is, this is, this is very bad Yes, because you now have mercenaries who haven't been paid and they are all together in a large camp outside Carthage and they're starting to get restive. So Gisco by now is back in Carthage as well. And because he had been their commander, the Carthaginian Senate thinks, well, we should send him out t- to negotiate with them. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, they'll be delighted to see yeah. their old their old commander. Yeah. So Gisco goes out and he's sent with as much treasure as the uh, Carthaginians can rustle up. And he goes out to the camp. Meanwhile, however, in the camp, there are two mercenaries, um, one of whom, a, a guy called Spendius, is an escaped slave from Campania who had taken service as a mercenary. And another is a guy called Matho, who is a Libyan. So, do, you to, do you want to know what uh, Flaubert says about Matho, Tom? Yeah, tell, tell me what Flaubert says he about He introduces Matho. him thus. On the other side of the tables was a Libyan of colossal stature with short, black, curly hair. He had retained only his military jacket, the brass plates of which were tearing the purple of the couch. A necklace of silver moons was tangled in his hairy breast. His face was stained with splashes of blood. He was leaning on his left elbow with a smile on his large open mouth. So Flaubert that is what Matho is like. That That's, is what yeah. Matho is like. Yeah. And he's hairy, he's huge, <laughs> he's smiling and he's covered in blood. He rips couches, all that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> so, so Spendius and Matho have essentially got the mercenaries behind them. They've said, look, let's just go, let's conquer Carthage and take, take it all, take it over. And um, they are duly appointed generals of the mercenary force. And so when um, Gisco comes, they say, let's take him prisoner. So they take him prisoner and yeah. they, they seize all the, uh, the gold that's been sent and they remint it. So this is, you know, Carthaginian coinage. The mercenaries remint it and they're stamping it. And they're kind of saying that, you know, they are, they're a kind of proto-state. Yeah. And there are 20,000 mercenaries. And that because of Matho, this giant hairy Libyan, yeah. ha, 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 um, they are able to raise uh, maybe up to kind of 70,000 Libyans from the interior beyond Carthage. So this is, you know, almost 100,000 troops. Tom, I, you know, I the Carthaginians say, don't really have the men to oppose they don't them. Have any, yeah, they don't. It, I love this. I love the mercenary war. I love Salambo, which I did at uh, university. And basically it's just unbelievably sadistic and blood-soaked, isn't it? What follows? Absolutely hideous. And, and Polybius says that this is, of all wars, the, the, the war in which the greatest atrocities and cruelties were practised. And in part, that is because the mercenaries know that by taking this step, you know, if they're defeated, they can expect no mercy. But likewise, Carthage knows that she is fighting for her very survival. So what are you going to do if you're Carthage and you're fighting for your very survival? Obviously, you're going to turn to a Hanno. This is what you do in the situation, despite <laughs> the fact that as far as I, you know, from the records, Has no every Hanno time a Hanno <laughs> leads some, you know, he's, they, they turn out They've to be never terrible. never with a Hanno, Tom. So this guy, he's called Hanno the Great. And this okay. is because he seems to have been the most significant political player in Carthage for the previous two decades. So while Hamilcar is is the great military leader, Hanno seems to have been the you know the great the the the, 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 the political commander in chief. So he gets told go out and defeat these mercenaries. Predictably, he makes complete hash of it, and so the people say, "Well, Hanno's hopeless. Let's have Hamilcar. He's the military hero. Let's make him." Um, uh, joint commander with Hanno. So he's given a very small army, only about 10,000 men, a few war elephants. But because he's a brilliant general, he's able to go out and win the victories that Hanno had been unable to. And the mercenaries are defeated in a couple of battles. And in the camp, Spendius and Matho are nervous that this may lead to mass desertions. And so they decide to take a step that will effectively ensure that all the mercenaries are dipping their fingers in blood. So yeah. what they do, contrary to all the laws of war, is that they put Gisco and the other Carthaginian members of the embassy to death, and they do it horribly. God, so what they do, here, Tom. They, they cut the hands off of Gisco and the other Carthaginians. Yeah. They castrate them. 
Yeah. And we haven't had some genital mutilation for a while. And they then break their legs. They throw them into a pit and they then bury them alive. And the leaders of the mercenaries, so Spendius and Matho, then say that this is how all Carthaginian prisoners of war will be treated. So they really and are so now making it, it impossible absolute, now to have any settlement. It is absolutely a war to the death. And so Hamilcar reciprocates. If he captures any, any of the mercenaries, he has them trampled to death by elephants. Hanno is still on the scene, but general acceptance is that he's, he's so rubbish that in this war to the death, you know, they need Hamilcar. And so the troops, all the Carthaginian troops, vote for Hamilcar to be sole general. And this is obviously good because it, it, it means that the guy best qualified to win the war now has sole command. Yeah. And there are also two other positives. And one is that help uh, and reinforcements arrive from Carthage's old enemy, Syracuse. And the reason for this probably is that Hero, who is still in situ, you know, he's nervous about the Romans being too powerful. So he wants Carthage to survive. So it will be a counterweight to the Romans. Right. But help also comes from Rome. So they release all the prisoners, Carthaginian prisoners that they'd been keeping without demanding a ransom. And they, they issue an absolutely strict ban that no one in Italy is allowed to help the mercenaries. And again, you might think, well, why are they doing this to their old enemy? And the reason, obviously, is because they want Carthage to survive so that it can pay the indemnity. So it's a little bit as if the Allies had intervened to help the Weimar Republic yeah. during the German Revolution. Or something. Yes, I think that's exactly the analogy. Things are, are, are starting to improve for uh, Carthage. And then in 238, so a couple of years after the outbreak of the revolt, the great decisive moment comes when Hamilcar successfully traps um, a, a large chunk of the mercenary army in a narrow pass called the Saw. So it's called the Battle of the Saw. Yeah, but and he, Flaubert calls it the Defile of the Axe, which I think sounds better than the Saw. Yeah, Defile of the Axe is better, I agree. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, yeah, that's just whatever. by the by. Well, let's, I mean, call it the, the, probably... let's call it the Defile of the, the, defile of the Axe. Um, and Hamilcar kind of blockades them, you know, and there's none of this Samnite thing of la allowing them to go through a yoke or anything like that. Right. Hamilcar, you know, basically he starves them out. And so the mercenaries... Um, they kill their prisoners, they kill their slaves, they eat them. And then once they've done that, they recognize that, that they've got no choice but to negotiate. And so Spendius had been in charge of this. Matho is with the other army. So Spendius and nine other of the, of the mercenaries go out to treat with Hamilcar. And Hamilcar offers them what seemed to be very mild terms. He says, yeah, fine. Um, you know, you can, you can go. The, the, the whole army can go. Um, but you will need to leave me with... Um, 10 hostages and Spendius and the, his nine colleagues agree. And of course the 10 hostages that Hamilcar chooses is Spendius and, and uh, he gets the other nine negotiators. Very canny. Yes. And so he, uh, he then, uh, he seizes them, keeps them, make, you know, fetters them up and then slaughters the entire army. Oh, he breaks his word. He does break his word because he says that um, the murderers of Gisco were beyond the pale. And fair. that's fair. You know, I think Tom, they behave very poorly is, to Gisco. And to be yeah. honest, do you have to keep your word to a mercenary anyway? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so now the war reaches its, can I say, hideous climax? Oh, we love a hideous we climax. A hideous Tom. climax. So Hamilcar and his deputy, inevitably called Hannibal. I mean, but not, so but running, he's not. But he's not Hannibal. To this be is clear. not the famous Hannibal, who will be coming to shortly. Hamilcar and his deputy called Hannibal. They march on uh, the remaining army, which is led by Matho, the Libyan, big hairy Libyan. And they arrive outside Matho's camp and they, um, they put up 10 crosses and they nail Spendius and the other nine ambassadors to the crosses and they, um, they kind of leave them there. And Matho is so outraged so appalled so humiliated that he summons his men and they ambush uh, Hannibal's force and they capture Hannibal and they torture him at the foot of Spendius's cross and they then take down the the the, the body of Spendius and they nail Hannibal alive to the cross uh, and they take um, 30 high-ranking Carthaginian prisoners and they sacrifice them 
at the foot of the cross as a kind of, you know, a sacrifice to the spirit of Spendius. And Hamilcar in the face of this has to be to retreat, but it's fine. You know, he he hasn't suffered any major defeat mm -hmm. and he patches things up with Hanno and the, the two of them advance out again. And in uh, the autumn of 238, they meet with the, the surviving mercenaries and they win an absolutely crushing victory. Uh, most of the mercenaries are wiped out. The survivors are all crucified and Matho is taken prisoner. So Matho and, survived, but yeah, his fate is uh, very exciting, isn't it? Yes. So he is taken to Carthage and uh, kept in prison for a year. And then in the following year, 237, he's, he is made to walk through the streets of Carthage in a kind of parody of the triumphal procession that he would have enjoyed had he managed to enter the great city. Um, and Dominic, I'm sure you'll remember it from uh, reading Salambo. It, it, there's a horrible, horrible account of it. It's the kind of, we love a hideous climax. It's the hideous climax of Salambo. And uh, according to Flo, in Flaubert's version of it, it's decreed that he can walk through the streets without an escort, but with his arms tied behind his back. And um, the crowds are not allowed to put out his eyes because Matho has to be able to see what is being done to him. And they're not uh, allowed to cripple him because he has to carry on walking. And they're not allowed to inflict anything that would kill him. But that anything else, they can do what they want to do. And so this is uh, Flaubert's description of what happens. The crowds discharged little drops of boiling oil through tubes at him. They strewed pieces of broken glass beneath his feet. Still, he walked on. The slaves of the council struck him with their whips of hippopotamus leather so furiously and long that the fringes of their tunics were drenched with sweat. Matho appeared insensible. Suddenly he started off and began to run at random, making a noise with his lips like one shivering with severe cold. That's not even the, the worst bit, Tom. I get you. Well, do you want to come to the worst bit? Uh, well, I mean, there's so many bits because Flaubert, as we said in the first episode, he really kind of goes to town on this, doesn't he? A child rent his ear. A young girl hiding the point of a spindle in her sleeve spit his cheek. They tore handfuls of hair from him, and he was very hairy, and strips of flesh. Others smeared his face in sponges, with sponges steeped in filth and fastened upon sticks. Yeah. And then it just kind of, of course, goes on and yeah, on and on. Yeah, just, yeah. And at the end, it's Flaubert says at one point... Um, he was just a, he was he had no appearance of humanity left. He was a long, perfectly red shape. Yeah, I mean, so, by the standards of eighteen sixties, kind of it's not novels. Man of Bovary, is it? No, no, no. I mean, it's not Dickens even. So, so this takes us back to um, to where we began with uh, Flaubert's uh, kind of imagining of Carthage, uh, and of course, we opened this series, Dominic, with. Um, Flaubert imagining a, a sacrifice to Moloch, the, um, the the Carthaginian elite sacrificing their children um, in this great blazing furnace, which which you do at moments of particular peril because your child, of course, is the most precious thing that you have. Um, and in that account, Hamilcar is pressured by the council to sacrifice his eldest son, who, of course, had been born while um, Hamilcar was in Sicily. And this boy was given the name of Hannibal. So Hannibal Barker. Yeah. And um, it's an echo of a scene that almost certainly did happen. And it didn't involve Moloch and it didn't involve human sacrifice, but it did involve sacrifice before the greatest of the gods of Carthage, which was Baal Hamon. Mm -hmm. And Hamilcar Barker, um, he is now the greatest man in Carthage. He has won this great victory over the uh, over the mercenaries. He was the last man standing against the Romans in Sicily. And yet at the same time, he has been powerless to oppose the Romans who were behaving very, very badly. Even though the Romans did not intervene in the mercenary war, they take advantage of Carthage's distraction to seize Sardinia against the terms of the peace treaty. Um, and when the Carthaginians complain, the Romans threaten them with war. So it's like that phrase that the Gauls had said to the Romans when they captured uh, Rome and extorted lots of treasure out of them, vi victrix, woe to the defeated. Mm. And so the Carthaginians have no option but to suck it up. But obviously they feel 
incredible resentment. And probably there's no one who feels greater resentment than, than Hamilcar, this great patriotic figure, greatest military leader, the man who dreams of seeing his city to restored to her former position as undisputed mistress of the West. And so he knows that he needs to find some way with Sicily off limits, with Sardinia lost, to restore Carthage's fortunes and above all finances. And so he looks to Spain because Spain is a place so rich in silver that it is said when there, is, when there are forest fires on the high slopes of the mountains, liquid silver runs in torrents down the side of the hill. And so he decides that this is where he's going to go. He's going to carve out a new empire. He sets out for there in 237. But before he leaves, as I say, he goes to offer sacrifice to Baal Hamon. And he takes with him his eldest son, this little boy, Hannibal, who by now is about nine years old. And he offers sacrifice and the omens prove favourable. Baal Hamon approves of Hamilcar's expedition to Spain. And this then done, Hamilcar orders uh, everyone to withdraw except for his young boy, Hannibal. And he calls Hannibal, you know, come and stand by me. And then he says, would you like to come with me to Spain? And Hannibal's eyes light up and he says, yes, I, I, I would love to come to Spain. I want to be with you. And Hamilcar nods. And then he tells his son, lay your hand you know, on the, on the carcass of the sacrificial victim and swear this oath that you will never bear goodwill to the Romans. And the little boy swears it, that he will never bear goodwill to the Romans. And this boy, that nine-year-old son of Hamilcar, Hannibal Barker, after Hamilcar, Hamilcar goes on to die in Spain, having car carved out the great empire that he'd wanted to carve out, Hannibal will succeed to its rule and in due course, he will launch an invasion of Italy itself, leading war elephants over the Alps and bringing the Romans to a succession of terrible defeats and bringing Rome itself to the very brink of utter disaster. And Hannibal will be remembered by the Romans for all time as the greatest of all their enemies and Dominic Next year, maybe, we will continue the story of Carthage. We and will we indeed. Will look at the rise to greatness of Hannibal. We will indeed. Uh, so what a, what, a, what a wonderful series, Tom, and what a, an amazing um, incentive for people to carry on listening to the rest of history, knowing <laughs> yes. that one day when they least expect it, Hannibal will, be will return. <laughs> so uh, that was a, a fantastic, a, a blood-drenched tour de force, everything that uh, we wanted from a, a history of Carthage. Tom, thank you very much. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. So next week, we have a complete change of tone. We will be returning with a history of chocolate from its Mesoamerican origins to its glory days in, um, in Victorian Birmingham. And then the episode that I think many people have been waiting for for years, frankly, um, that you'll only get on The Rest is History. And that is, of course, history's greatest monkeys. So we will see you for those episodes next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.